So, um, good morning, everybody. Um, before I start, I'd just like to thank the organizers and sponsors of this conference. It's a really fantastic uh, opportunity, um, I think, for all of us, and all of us have so far enjoyed very much uh, the varied uh, but really important contributions. I noticed one thing when I got on the, on the shuttle bus this morning, which is very rare for the third day of a conference. Everybody was smiling, so I think that's very much um, down to the organizers of the conference. So, so thank you, and it is a real uh, pleasure and a privilege uh, to, to speak in front of you today. Um, so I was asked to talk about uh, research partnerships and specifically from, uh, from the uh, perspective of an international NGO. Um, and really I got thinking about that. Why is it that Oxfam you know, doesn't have a long-term 15, 20 year research partnership on wheat breeding? That's kind of the way I, 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 I started thinking about this, the, the, this question. Um, and, and so really that's what I'm, go I'm gonna try to talk about. The, the fact that research partnerships can be hugely effective in poverty alleviation, but actually to some extent we're all living in different worlds and it's trying to find the moments when those worlds come together that makes research partnerships effective. So just start off with a couple of fairly obvious notes of caution. So research partnerships Absolute, you know, can be absolutely fundamental uh, for, for poverty alleviation. And the three things I'm going to talk about, firstly, understanding that research is actually the solution to the problem. Secondly, um, that you really understand both partners or the multiple partners involved really understand what the nature of the problem is that you're trying to resolve. And then the last and in a sense the easiest thing is about aligning incentives. So as many other people have said over the last three days, um, the obscenity of our times is that um, despite all the fantastic, uh, extraordinary efforts, many of them started by Norman Borlaug, of course, um, in increasing the production of food, we still have around about 840, 850 million people, that's 12% of the global population, unable to meet their dietary requirements. So the issue in terms of poverty alleviation here is one of food security. And food security, is, as I'm sure you all know, is defined as when all, uh, all people at all times have the physical and economic access to sufficient, safe, nutritious food to meet their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. And the first point I'm going to start making here is that food security is not the same as food production. Very obvious point. There are four things needed for food security. Availability, access, use, and stability. Now, food production, yield, does affect those, but, uh, and, and very fundamentally in, in a couple of cases, either directly through the quantity of food or through market signals. But there are additional things that are needed for food security on top of yield. So, what then is the, the kind of nature of the, of, of, of the solutions we need to crack the problem, to crack this extraordinary uh, failing, if you like, in development that 850 million people or thereabouts go to bed hungry every night? Well, the food system is complex. It's, a, it's an agricultural but also a social and economic system. And so often what looks like a solution can create positive outcomes, but also perverse, unwanted outcomes. And a great example of this is the Green Revolution, which, as we've heard over the last three days, has brought about so much good in the world. And yet, <clears throat> one and a half to two billion people are in smallholder agriculture families. Um, and those people, those producers of food, include around about half the world's un undernourished. That's a really odd outcome. And part of the reason for that outcome, of the triangle on the, on the left-hand side of the, of the slide, is that smallholders are, in and of themselves, a very mixed and diverse bunch. 
<clears throat> now, I won't go into this in, uh, this in huge detail. There's a very small percentage that are already growing profitable crops, high-value crops, into high-value markets, 1% to 2% roughly. This is fairly robust, these figures across uh, different geographies, as work uh, by Steve Wiggins and colleagues um, has, has shown. Um, then there's a slice of around about 15%. Um, they are smallholders that regularly sell into markets. Um, these are the small, if you like, that we know what to do with. Actually, fairly small tweaks um, can get those uh, smallholders into a state of uh, uh, where, where their agriculture is really bringing them out of poverty. And it's a, a lot often around collectivization, collective bargaining power in markets. Um, in the, Rural, what's called Rural World 2, 20 to 30% of smallholders, those farms are occasionally connected into markets, but they often lack the quality of land, the physical access to markets, and so on to be able to really uh, uh, grow themselves out of poverty by selling into markets. Um, and then there's a big rump, 40 to 50% of smallholders are essentially subsistence, often landless farm laborers, um, in very marginal places with very irregular rainfall, um, for which actually their land is never going to help them out of poverty. It's just part of a very diverse um, set of ways in which they try to make ends meet. <clears throat> so a s straightforward single solution into this kind of complex dynamic situation, as I said, can bring all sorts of uh, all sorts of outcomes, some intended, some unintended. Um, and yet we know that the, the economic growth in the smallholder agricultural sector is by far the most effective way of reducing poverty and food insecurity. It's far more effective. Invest in smallholder agriculture in a developing country and it is the best way of reducing poverty and food insecurity. And there are some great examples. Um, Vietnam invested hugely in smallholder agriculture. Things like uh, rural infrastructure, roads, um, irrigation systems, electrification, sanitation, um, and very critically, land reforms. And that transformed Vietnam from being a food deficient country in the 1990s to being a major exporter today. Um, and that was based on investment in smallholder agriculture. Um, but actually quite little of that was to do with yield. Right? Quite little of that was to do with growing crops. It was to do with the fundamental infrastructure, such as roads and electricity, and the fundamental assets that lie behind production, such as land reform. And so I think we need to really think a little bit more about what actually is the nature of the challenge of, of food security. And I just want to set up a very quick, uh, if you like, title fight between Malthus and Thomas Malthus and Amartya Sen here. Um, so Malthus, as an 18th century uh, philosopher and economist, um, was the first person to, to, to really signal the idea that population increases faster than, than production. And so ultimately, ultimately uh, food will always check population growth. And a lot of the things that we, we have been talking about and quite rightly been talking about, not just in this meeting, but, but really I think most of us as professionals, um, are really thinking about what happens when there isn't enough food. Um, so, planetary boundaries um, on, the, uh, 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 on the left, uh, the fact that you know, climate change, nitrogen cycle, biodiversity, we are reaching, we've gone beyond the safe operating space for, for humanity, and we're rapidly approaching uh, others. Um, climate change, the graph in the middle, um, the, the hockey stick graph with, many, that with which many of you are familiar, and population growth, although as Sir Gordon Conway said um, on the first day of the conference, uh, and, and quite rightly, um, it's not population growth per se, it's the change in diets uh, compared with population growth um, that, it, that is the real driver. But all of these things, climate change, population growth, change in diets, you know, are leading to a genuine concern that in the next few decades there may simply not be enough food. So that's a Malthusian-type problem. Malthusian-type solutions tend to focus on production. They tend to be technological, 
tend to be very attractive to policymakers because they are apparently straightforward, a new variety, a new agricultural technique. Now, I'd compare that view of the challenge, view of the problem that we're facing as people who are, who are intensely involved in agriculture and intensely concerned with development um, with Amartya Sen's work. Um, and he made very clear that starvation is the characteristic of, pe characteristic of people not having enough food to eat. It is not the characteristic of there not being enough food to eat. That's a really critical distinction. And if you look at all sorts of la lines of evidence, whether it's actually what proportion of the uh, world's current uh, food production would be required um, so that there was no hunger in the world, if you look at waste, if you look at obesity, it's very clear that we are living in, uh, currently, we are living in uh, a world in which, which is dominated by, by, by Sen's conclusions. So, really what we're saying here is that the amount of food um, is necessary but not sufficient to feed the world. In other words, having enough food in the world is not the same as everybody in the world having enough food to eat. Um, but there's a kind of problem here that the, 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 the sort of solutions that derive from, from Sen's analysis tend to focus on access and entitlement. They're messy things, they're contextual, they're um, to, to do with power, um, things like redistribution, land reform, social protection, freedom of the press. All of these are really key components to overcoming food insecurity. But they're a lot less attractive to policymakers. So, so we have a question about what the nature of the real challenge is. Um, about fe feeding the world. Um, and what's clear to me from that is that we are currently very much living in a, 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 a world where Sen's analysis is correct. The question to me is how soon is it before things become Malthusian? How soon is it before climate change actually starts reducing the production beyond which there simply isn't enough food to eat? Um, that's an open question. I'm not going to attempt to answer it. Um, in terms of research partnerships, if you agree on the problem and, and agree that research is part of the answer, there's another set of questions that we have to think about. And there are lots and lots of, different, uh, of differences between research organizations and international NGOs like Oxfam. So there's very different uh, incentives in terms of time. A lot of what Oxfam uses research for is to try to get changes in policy. Generally speaking, speaking, there are very short windows, maybe two months, six months, a year. And that's very different from the incentives of research institutions. Even uh, disciplines like, I don't know, geography or ecology will be thinking about two or three year timelines before they get publish their papers. Um, as we know, there can be a 20, 30, 40, 50 year time lag between investment in research in agriculture and, and those varieties or, or techniques um, having wide uptake. There are limitations around language. Uh, just a, a simple exam example is that when a member of the public uses the word significant, they mean important. When a scientist uses the word significant, they mean something very precise and statistical. I have to confess at this point that I am a scientist by background. Um, uh, I'm probably, I'm the only person I know in Oxfam um, I think who has a, uh, a, a, a PhD in the physical sciences, which means I spend quite a lot of my time translating the language of science into the language that my social science colleagues can understand. Um, there's also a kind of a, a difference in, 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 in purpose. Oxfam uses research and, and development NGOs use research um, as, a, as a means to an end. Oh, you know, we, we need evidence to change our practice or to, to try to bring about change in policy, um, we don't, uh, which is quite a different use of research from, uh, uh, from a lot of academic organizations where uh, publishing a paper in a, uh, in, in a high-ranking journal is a strong incentive. Um, and there's also the very obvious thing about actually what working through what different organizations can bring to a research partnership.
Right, so that's some of the pitfalls, if you like, some of the things you have to think about in research partnerships. But I'm going to give you a couple of examples of where things are really working, and these are examples from Oxfam. Um, and before I go into the details of this, which frankly you can read and you don't necessarily uh, need to hear me speak through, um, I was doing a, a, a rough calculation that, about, that Oxfam spends about, Oxfam GB that is, spends about 10 million pounds a year on research. So it's, it's not a small amount of, of money, it's an, a fairly significant amount of money. But I just wanted to highlight a couple of relevant, quite large research, research collaborations that we're doing. Um, one on food price volatility. Um, and this is a really interesting thing, trying to look across um, different geographies and urban and rural uh, uh, communities to see how food prices are really affecting their life and their well-being. We, we had the baseline data last year. We're just about to publish the first year's data. One of the really interesting things um, which, which has come out already, um, uh, and it was very beautifully put by one of the, uh, one of the people that we're interviewing uh, from a community, I think it was in Bangladesh. Um, and this woman said, food has taken the place of love. Now that doesn't make any sense, does it? How can food take the place of love? But actually, it was a very good summary of one of the things we were finding, that actually in times of higher food prices, more and more of poor families' effort is put into trying to get food for the family. And that's displacing all sorts of social interactions in the family, between ex uh, uh, the immediate and the extended family, and, and all sorts of social interactions are actually being downgraded and less time and effort is being spent on them so that people can feed themselves. Um, so that's, uh, say, a, a, a very exciting. We're, we're sort of one and a half years into a four and a half year project there between Oxfam and the Institute of Development Studies. Um, and the second one I'd like to highlight is, uh, again, about a four year project um, with a whole, it's part of a consortium, University of Cape Town, University of East Anglia, uh, the Indian Institute for Human Settlements, Oxfam and, and, and others. Um, where we are really looking at what are the actionable strategies and policies that will really help, uh, really help people adapt to climate change um, in, in arid and semi-arid regions, um, a strong focus on sub-Saharan Africa. That's just starting out, um, so we are very, uh, very hopeful about that. Um, and these are two multi-million pound research collaborations that Oxfam is doing. One of the interesting reflections I had um, about this, though, is that both of these came about with organizations that we have been actually working with in a very small way for a long time. So to get all the alignment of all the things that I've been talking about, the alignment of, of agreeing what the problem is, agreeing the role of research in solving that problem, um, aligning the sort of priorities, the language, uh, the timing, all of that came about through actually uh, an almost accidental upfront investment in several years. So for example, the person, chief collaborator with the University of Cape Town uh, is, a, is a, 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 a brilliant climatologist called Dr. Mark New, who I've known for 10 years. We've done bits and pieces of work together. Um, it's gradually come into this. We've gradually found the sweet spot where we can work together on something ambitious. Um, similarly with the Institute, Institute of Development Studies, we've done little bits and pieces of work together over many years and again gradually found the spe sweet spot where we can do some really powerful uh, uh, and highly relevant work on food price volatility. So the thing I want to leave you with is that poverty alleviation is an incredibly complex socio-economic problem. Um, as Vietnam shows, and, and it just simply isn't the case that there being enough food in the world means that everybody has enough food to eat. Um, the Vietnam example is a really good one of that, where a whole suite of, of, of conditions had to change before, uh, before food security could be reached. Um, and as I've talked about, there's a whole, uh, there's a whole then different set of things that you have to work through in a research partnership, um, agreeing on the, uh, on the fact that, uh, on the nature of the problem, um, in, uh, aligning your incentives. 
However, this really does happen and does yield research partnerships which do have an impact on poverty. And already our food price volatil volatility work you know, has, is already having an impact in several countries on the way that the governments of those countries are thinking about food price volatility and thinking about what measures they can put in place um, to reduce the impact of food price volatility on the poor and vulnerable people in their population. Thank you.